This is the Value Investor Podcast with Tracy Reinick. All things value, all the time. Welcome back, value investors. So at the 2020 Berkshire Hathaway Annual Shareholders Meeting, Warren Buffett again talked about his mentor, Benjamin Graham, who I've mentioned many times on this podcast before. And he's considered by everyone to be the father of value investing. That's just what his title is now. But he's also one of the best long-term investors in history of having like a documented uh, multi-year, decades, double-digit returns in the stock market. And Buffett said in this year's annual meeting that he listed him as one of the smartest people he had ever met. Uh, None of this is surprising because Buffett has said this stuff about Graham many times in the past. But if you don't know Benjamin Graham, he died in 1976. So it's been a long time now since he passed on. And all of us never got the chance to learn directly from him as the master investor like Warren Buffett did. But he did leave us with a gift, and that was his book, The Intelligent Investor, which I've done numerous podcasts on now over the last year or so. And so you can go back into the archives and check out some of those, including the first podcast I did, which was, should you read The Intelligent Investor? Mm -hmm. So if you recall, it, it was first published in 1949. And Warren Buffett um, at the annual meeting called that book, The Intelligent Investor, the book that changed his life. So that's pretty strong words about a book, right? Um, How many times have all of us said, oh, I just read XYZ book and it changed my life? There might be occasionally outside of, you know, some religious texts, I should add, um, But it doesn't happen that often. So when he said that, um, again, at the shareholder meeting this year, you know, it it brought me back to the intelligent investor again and that we should look at it again. Now, again, if you don't know, the intelligent investor was the first book specifically written for you and I, for the individual investor, not the professionals. He wasn't trying to tell people how to get rich off of the stock market. This was, again, 1949. So a lot of people were still gun shy after the Great Depression. There was no computers, like individual computers, so you couldn't trade easily. You had to have a financial advisor, investment advisor who who did all the trades. That all cost a lot of money. So um, it wasn't that easy to be an individual investor, but this book basically was laying out to people about how to become owners of great businesses. That was the whole purpose of the book so much. Not so much how to get rich investing in stocks, but how to be a business owner through the stock market. So Benjamin Graham wrote four versions of the book before his death in 1976. So there was four updated versions that he kept adding and and changing out some of his chapters over the years based on what was going on in the economy and market conditions and new examples he could put in uh, to support the original premise over the years. And then we had uh, the 1980s, the big bull market of the 80s and 90s, and the dot-com boom, and then the bust. And it was at that point that the current Wall Street Journal Uh, reporter Jason Zwig took up the mantle to update the book. And that's when the fifth version of the book came out long after Benjamin Graham's death with the blessing of Warren Buffett, who wrote the intro to it. And that one was out in 2003. So just after the dot-com bust. Now, recently, I've gotten some questions on social media from people wanting a more recent book on value investing under the belief that the intelligent investor just is no longer relevant. It's old. And, you know, why should I read something from uh, 2003, 17 years ago? Uh, There must be something that I can relate to better is basically the questions I'm getting now. But trust me, it still is extremely relevant. Even the original chapters from Benjamin Graham, which now are from the 1970s, are completely relevant. And then Jason Zwig's updates on each of the chapter are still relevant as well. 
So um, don't think you shouldn't read it because it's older. It still is, as I said, extremely relevant, and the lessons remain the same no matter what era of investing you are in. And maybe the company names have changed. Maybe it's no longer Xerox, but now it's Microsoft instead of Xerox, right? So, but you can still apply the same lessons. And I know many of you look at the size of the intelligent investor. Um, I, I looked at it again over this last weekend to prepare for this podcast. It's sitting here on my coffee table, actually. And yes, it's massive because it's got two chapters for every chapter, essentially. It's got the Benjamin Graham original chapters and then the Jason Zwig chapters. And so it, it comes out to 536 pages, excluding the appendixes and like the stuff at the back and <laughs> some of the other stuff. So it's still massive. If you include all that, I think it's like 600 pages with the indexes and appendices and everything. But the actual reading part is about 536 pages. And it just does seem like a grind, right? Um, I want the secrets to be kind of like just put in front of me with, you know, 10 bullet points or something or five bullet points, not 536 pages. But, um, you know, it does have all the relevant information you need in it. And I know the reluctance uh, to read it because I've had reluctance to reread it, which I've talked about on this podcast. I already read it once and then I didn't want to read it again because of the size. Right. And but how I did it was really by going chapter by chapter, because that is the type of book it is. You can read just one chapter and, and stop and like absorb the lessons from that chapter. You don't have to read the whole thing all on one one or two sittings or, you know, dedicate like, you know, half your vacation to reading it. Um, no, you can just read little by little and take in those lessons. So for this podcast, I wanted to do that again. I wanted to look at another chapter in the book and I thought a good place to start for this one might be at the end, the last chapter, chapter 20, given what's going on with the coronavirus impacts and the uh, coronavirus crisis that we had in the stock market and now the rebound in a lot of the stocks that have a lot of people wondering, like, is, is this rally for real? How much am I spending to, to get mm -hmm. these stocks here on this rebound when earnings are being cut? And so I thought it'd be good to, to check in with the final chapter. There is a postscript, but so this is not the postscript. It's just the chapter, chapter 20. And the title of that chapter is Margin of Safety as the Central Concept of Investment. So again, I thought this was very relevant. Margin of safety, yeah, I wanna know all about that right now <laughs> with the coronavirus, right? So confronted with the challenge to uh, distill the secret of sound investing into three words, this is Graham's own words, he settled on margin of safety. And then, so he writes, for stocks, bought under normal conditions, the margin of safety lies in an expected earnings power consider considerably above the going rates for bonds. That's, again, the keywords may be in there, under normal conditions, right? So the risk isn't that you'll pay too high a price for good quality stocks, he says. It's that you'll buy low quality stocks when times are good, because the good economic times mask the company's weakness. And I think many of us can relate to that advice right here. Many of us have been buying, or even right now, are looking at buying low quality stocks, even though the times aren't even good, because um, you know some of the better economic conditions mask the underlying weakness. So then he goes on, how do you find the better quality stocks. He said, dividends need to be tested over a series of years and in abnormal market conditions like a recession. So we have that, right? We, we have abnormal conditions now. And then he said about growth stock investors, the growth stock investor relies on earnings growth power that is greater than that shown in the past, but it may not happen. It depends on if the growth is made conservatively or not when you are evaluating the company. So are you being realistic about the type of growth that growth stock could have? 
And do you really believe that it can be greater than that shown in the past? Because that's the only reason you're paying a higher valuation, right? Is to get that bigger growth component. But if that's not there, well, you've just basically bought an overvalued stock. Um, and that's not good. That's not what we want to do as value investors, right? So then he goes on to talk about diversification. And this was in his opening chapter. So it's fitting that, of course, he's covering it in his final chapter again. Diversification is key. Even with a margin of safety, an individual company may still not make it. That's why you have to wager on a bunch of them in your portfolio and hope for the best. That's what he means by diversification. Don't just own like five stocks. That's not diverse enough. One of them may, may go under. Um, and so you need to have enough in there to balance it out. Now, what is enough? That's been debated over the years. Some said 12 stocks is enough to be diverse. Others say it's 20. Um, it, once you get up to like 50, 60, it's very hard to manage, but some look at like 50. If you're running a huge portfolio, like, uh, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, they have 47 stocks now. Um, although yes, I believe it's still 47, mm -hmm. but they've sold some recently. So they were slightly over 50, but diversification, Graham says, is the companion to the margin of safety. He also argues that a sufficiently low price stock can turn a stock of mediocre quality into a sound investment opportunity, provided that you who are buying it are informed and you have adequate diversification in the rest of your portfolio. So sometimes those kind of, uh, you know, so-so companies can really sell off and get super cheap, and then it is a good investing opportunity. And we've seen some of that over even this year with the coronavirus sell-off, where suddenly stocks that were maybe overvalued, that you know don't have a growth trajectory or aren't in the right uh, business industry, suddenly got so cheap. Yes, it did make some sense to get in there. So. You can also um, look at some of those that are, uh, you know, sell off as like momentum type stocks that, um, you know, you could have the hot momentum type stocks that sell off and then those become risky in some people's minds, um, you know, because it was momentum before. Now it's not. Nobody wants some trying to think of some, there's some on the retail side that that has happened to you where they were super hot. Now they're not energy for sure. Some of the banks, JP Morgan was breaking out to new multi-year highs last year. Now it's off big. Seemingly no one wants it now. So you can get uh, some of these stocks, momentum stocks that are no longer momentum or momentum to the downside. And those can um, be, you know, areas to look at, but they can still be risky even after the sell-off, even on the downside, because remember, you own the business and you have to look at that first. A lot of investors tend to look at the stock price, right? That's what tends to drive it. I get a lot of this on stock twits like, oh, Tracy, this is down 30%. You're, you're an idiot for saying that this isn't cheap here, blah, blah, blah you know, all based on the stock price or, oh, Tracy, this is under $5. Of course, it's cheap. But that $5 stock could be one of these mediocre or even, you know, not so good companies, the weak companies that Graham is talking about. And then it's really not a good investment, right? Because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for an investment, not a trade. You own the business. So you have to look at that first. And, you know, he goes on to sum up the chapter um, on margin of safety by bringing up the four principles of being an intelligent investor once again. Because remember, that's the title of the book, right? Intelligent investor. We're trying to make smart choices as an investor, not a trader. So the first principle, remember, is know what you are doing. <laughs> that's a funny one, right? Sounds funny. Know your business. Why are you buying that energy company if you don't even know where they drill? Ask yourself that. 
ask yourself why you are buying a restaurant chain if you don't go to that restaurant. Ask yourself why you're buying a Chinese retailer if you've never stepped foot in any of their stores or ordered online from them. You, you can say, oh, I know plenty about it, but do you, if you've never used it or never investigated it, don't know where uh, the distribution facilities are, where they're, um, you know, the best places they're making money, you've never listened in on a conference call, know your business. That's the investing principle number one from the intelligent investor. Okay, number two is do not let anyone else run your business unless one, you can supervise their performance, or two, you have unusually strong reasons for having implicit confidence in their integrity and ability. And here, he's talking about financial advisors. <laughs> do not let anyone else be your financial advisor and just manage your money without supervising them or if you have some unusually strong reasons for uh, being confident in them. So that's something good to keep in mind. I'm always reminded on uh, things like this kind of advice about something Oprah Winfrey said many years ago when she was still doing her talk show. And she said when she got money, she um, did not allow some business managers, accountants to pay for anything over $500. She had to sign the check mm -hmm. on anything over $500 so that she was basically supervising where the money went, right? So that's what this is. That's what he's reminding you to do. Principle number three, do not enter upon an operation that is manufacturing or trading an item unless you have a fair chance to yield a profit. So he's really talking about running the business here, but he does say trading an item. So do not buy that stock unless in that company and become an owner unless you have a chance to yield a profit. That makes some sense, right? Except again, there's those of us who are buying plenty of companies that are not yielding profit right now as investors, not even as traders. So keep number three in mind. And then number four, have the courage of your knowledge and experience. If you know the facts and the judgment is sound, act on it, even though others may hesitate or disagree. And wow, number four, this is the hardest of them to me. This is the essence of being a value investor. You are buying when others do not. You have investigated that business and decided, yes, it's undervalued. And even though others, others on stock twits, in your family, your friends, whoever, may be saying, no, you're crazy. Why are you buying that? It stinks or whatever they're saying about it. You know from your facts and your experience and your um, research into the company that it's sound and you're sticking with it. And that's the hardest part. So then he goes on to say, Courage becomes the supreme virtue after adequate knowledge and a tested judgment are at hand. This is also the hardest part of investing too. It does take courage to invest and to be a value investor. It takes courage to buck that trend. And courage is in an actual example we did just have, courage on investing. Um, and that was with Warren Buffett at Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting announcing he did not buy anything during the coronavirus sell-off because he didn't feel like anything was a deal and he felt like it was gonna stay or go lower for a lot longer than it was. So he analyzed the facts, he followed his experience and his knowledge and maybe some of his gut and he didn't buy, but that has caused um, you know, a lot of criticism and again, he's been under attack since since he said these comments and, and revealed that he hadn't bought anything for Berkshire Hathaway, that, you know, that he's lost his magic, he's old, he's out of touch, and et cetera, et cetera. This happens to him every 10 to 20 years where he's called out and said, you know, value isn't working and that his method is not the way to go. This is why Benjamin Graham ends the last chapter in this way with the principles, 
because it seems so easy, but it really isn't. And we'll all falter. Um, we all won't have the courage and that's okay because then sometimes we may find the courage and remember to be diverse that will help you have the courage and expect to see some losses because everyone has them graham acknowledges them he's he had them and buffett just took lo losses on all those airline investments so you take the losses and you move on i just recently did a podcast on that too so you can go listen to that one and intelligent investors, we try to cut the risk. We seek out margins of safety. We diversify. We try to cut the risk. And we're owners of the business. And we try to make the profit and money that way. It's okay to say no to the hot growth stocks with no earnings. You can still be a great investor without ever owning those. There's plenty of stocks out there. Most companies do make money and have earnings. So... If you're looking at Graham's checklist, you wouldn't be talking about a company like Microsoft on there because that actually might fit into Graham's checklist, right, of margin of safety. And um, so, you know, other than the valuation side, that one would fit. But I'm talking about companies like Wayfair that still hasn't seen any earnings, even with sales up double digits, right? If you're looking at margin of safety and, and at the actual business and what you're owning, Wayfair is not the one for you. I've said the same thing about Tesla over the years, but it's starting to actually see the earnings for the first time this year. And so that aspect of the business is turning around. So with Tesla, ticker TSLA, Wayfair, by the way, is W if you want to go look at it, but um, not a big fan here, as you can tell on Wayfair. But Tesla, um, it's it, even though there's earnings estimates being cut this year, is expected to still have earnings and then see it really grow again next year. So that story is beginning to change at Tesla and you're going to have to ask as a value investor, what do you pay for those earnings? What are you willing to pay for the growth and for those earnings there um, for Tesla? So how do we find other stocks with a margin of safety and to follow Graham's uh, analysis and his lessons here in the final chapter. I feel we have to start with the company's history of good management because he mentions the dividends in this chapter as part of the margin of safety, as, as part of finding them. And you want a company that has had a good track record of management over the years. And the only real way to screen for that, um, you can kind of do it with cash flows, which I've done in the past, but um, the dividend, you basically can't fake it. As we're finding out now during the coronavirus crisis, you either have the cash to pay it or you don't. And so um, dividends and consistent dividends over many years and growth in the dividends are all key factors for this part of Graham's analysis. So I did do a screen on looking for companies that had paid a dividend for at least five years I wanted to see some growth in that dividend. And then I did add in the Zach's ranks of number one or two to get the rising earnings estimates, if there are any at this point in time <laughs> out there. There are, though. There are. Um, there's a couple. Um, and then so I screened with all of that. And I got back, um, I don't remember exactly now. I want to say it was like 20, 20 or 23 stocks in the screen. So a little more than I thought because it's, it's got to have the dividend and so many companies are cutting that dividend right now. And then the ones or twos, that's even rarer. So I didn't even screen for PE on this, but I was able to pick out a couple of stocks that have the low PE. In fact, all three of these examples I'm leading off with from the screen have the low PE under 15. Um, so that was just kind of lucky, but I did think the dividend payers here might be on the cheaper side and that turned out to be true with these so let's dive into these three stocks and i'm going to give you two of the growth names that would fit into um graham's parameters as well because you might want to be looking at some of the growth names for the margin of safety aspect of them okay so the first one i've talked about this one in the past because it remains cheap and it's got the good zach's rank abv ticker a b b v so A, 
B is in boy, B is in boy, V, B is in Victor. This one just bought Allergan. That deal has been in the works for some time now. They finally just closed on it here in May 2020. So that's closing. That's the Botox. And I don't know about you, but on my Twitter feed and Instagram, I've seen some people running out to get their Botox refreshed <laughs> now that we're opening up. Yes, it's true. You can't stay away, right? You need it. Um, and they've been doing it in places like Georgia that opened up for the technicians, the dermatologists and stuff to be doing their Botoxing again. So yeah, that's the thing again. And now AbbVie owns it. So they are Zach's number one strong buy here. They have a PE of just 8.5 and their dividend, which they are paying still is yielding 5.2%. They last paid it in like February though. So it's coming up again soon. So tune in on that one to see if they do pay it, but there was no indication from any updates that I looked at that, that they were considering cutting it. Um, but again, every dividend's up for grabs at all times, especially right now. So that's ABV, ABBV. Uh, stock number two, um, this one is a hot one right here. And it's because it's in the food area, B and G Foods, ticker BGS. And they have a market cap of just 1.5 billion, but they distribute 50 well-known brands to your supermarkets all the time. And I took a look at the brands to see if I was using any of them, and I do. And some of the ones you might know, Green Giant, I, I know I was buying that at the supermarket because I wanted some frozen vegetables in case I couldn't go to the supermarket for like 10 days or two weeks. So Green Giant probably is having real good sales right here. Cream of Wheat is another one. Spice Islands, everybody buying the spices right now because they're cooking at home. And then Skinny Girl, if we need, we need the alcohol is uh, doing well here. Um, in the lockdowns. And so some people are probably buying that too. They do have a dividend and I double checked to make sure they are paying it and that it's yielding this. They did just announce they're paying it again. Um, early May, they announced, yes, it's paying. It's being paid out. Dividend yielding 8.2% here, 8.2% for B&G Foods. 63rd consecutive dividend payout here with the recent announcement. PE of just 11.5% and a Zach's number one strong buy for this one too. I'm almost talked myself into wanting to buy this stock. It has soared the last three months because again, food and all this packaged food, how long will that last? We don't know. With the reopening, are we now um, over that? Are we gonna be buying fresh now that we're able to go to some of the farmer's markets, all this stuff? I don't know, but um, shares, you know, again, soared over the last couple months here, but still cheap. Uh, okay, so the third stock, H&R Block, ticker HRB. They do the tax preparation. Some of that will be delayed because now we don't have to pay our taxes till July, right? That's a weird thing. I'm sure many people have already paid them, especially if you get a refund, but a lot of people probably still haven't. So this stretches out their dividend or their uh, tax prep season. And this one, um, they are still paying their dividend too, uh, dividend yielding 6.3%. Their last update on COVID was in March, and that's when they drew down $2 billion in their revolving credit facility just to be on the safe side. So they have a lot of cash sitting there, PE of just 5.3, so really cheap. It is off the lows, but really cheap down there. Um, Zach's number two buy stock here. So I promised some margin of safety with the growth names. I think we can all kind of know what the margin of safety is on these because these are the hot stocks right now that pay dividends and that have a history of paying for at least five years and that are unlikely to cut it here even with the cash crunch going on. And so both are two big tech names. It's no surprise, like I said, Microsoft is the first one, MSFT, tons of cash on hand paying a dividend, it's only yielding 1.1% as those shares have really bounced off the lows here. So Zach's number two buy, it's trading at 32 times, so it's pretty pricey, but it does have double digit uh, revenue growth right here. So still the, the trillion dollar market cap is still doing double digits, that's impressive. I do own Microsoft in my own personal portfolio. I bought it last year, I didn't buy any on the pullback here, 
And um, I'm not adding to my position here, but it does have the margin of safety, right? And then the second one on the tech side, Apple, AAPL, just a 1% yield now, um, trading at 25 times. That's the most expensive it's been in over well over a decade. Uh, Zach's number two, buy as well. Um, again, tons of cash, share buybacks, all that. Cash flows are enormous. So that yield is likely to be there, and it does have a margin of safety, even with its stores closed, all of that. So we all know the stories with both of those. That's why everybody's in them. Uh, but it does give you that margin of safety with a growth name, although Apple's growth, much, much less. So that's why I do not own Apple and I never have owned Apple. I don't have an Apple phone or a computer, so I was never one of the Apple stands. I know why people bought it, but um, I am an Android person, so I've always gone that way. But Apple, that does meet the requirements margin of safety. So remember, diversification is a type of margin of safety. It's the companion to the margin of safety. So buy more than a couple stocks if you were buying so that if there is some kind of big blow up, if you are Warren Buffett and own four airlines and the global economy gets shut down, yes, he took a loss after the collapse, he sold out, um, but is it really hurting his overall portfolio all that much? No, because <laughs> it was a small percentage and he owns, you know, 47 other stocks in there, including Apple, one of the other margin of safety companies. So keep that in mind. Graham never said to only be in a few stocks. He does give overall investing advice, um, not just how to find the cheapest stocks and be a value investor, but how to be that intelligent investor. And part of the intelligence is diversification, knowing what you buy, knowing the business, and um, having a lot of facts and knowledge, and then trusting yourself that you can do it. And you can. So keep that in mind. I was able to find these three value stocks that have a margin of safety pretty easily using the Zach screener. But the um, rank helped a lot in trying to find better quality names. So don't be afraid to use the rank. I haven't used it in the last couple of weeks up until now because the earnings side of the rank is, is uh, kind of wacky right now with everything happening with the coronavirus. But once those estimate cuts are coming in, we should see some estimate increases going forward here as the global economy opens up and Hopefully things aren't as bad on the earnings side as all the analysts originally thought and, and the companies originally thought. So keep all that in mind as we go forward. Now, this is a long podcast. I hope you made it all the way through the end, but I guess it's fitting. We had a long podcast for one of the longest investing books you could read, one of the largest ones. And I will be covering other chapters in there. I think I've covered five or six chapters already, plus now this chapter 20. And um, I always find new tidbits of information and it always energizes me to go back out there and uh, do some stock research and look around for some new investments of what companies do I wanna own and how can I be as successful an investor as Benjamin Graham? We can always hope, right? that we can end up with the returns like he did. So um, it's always fun to try. And let me recap now the tickers for this mm -hmm. episode. So we had ABV, ABBV. We had B&G Foods, which is BGS mm -hmm. with that big dividend, 8% dividend yield right there. Then we had H&R Block, uh, which was HRB is the ticker with that one. And then on the growth side, Microsoft, which I own, MSFT and Apple, AAPL. And again, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. I'm trying to bring you as much value content as I can. And so get us every week on Spotify. Spotify is the place to be. And I know a lot of you are over there. And Apple Podcasts, of course, they've got the big platform there. You can find the Value Investor Podcast there. And if you want even more podcasts, get two for one with the Zach's Market Edge. That's my other podcast I do every week. 
You can get tons of stock ideas with the two podcasts on SoundCloud. Subscribe over there to get both of them. But be sure to get us somewhere, and I'll see you again next time with some more stocks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identify and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.